I pay my obeisances to my spiritual master, <coughs> Sri Mitjagat Guru Sudarshan Acharya Ji Maharaj. I pay my obeisances to Lord Sri Ramanuj. I pay my obeisances to our Purva Acharyas. I pay my obeisances to our twelve Alvars. I pay my obeisances to Mother Lakshmi. And I pay my obeisances to Lord Sri Narayan. I welcome all of you here physically at the Sri Narayan Dam in Durban, South Africa. I welcome those that's watching this discourse locally, nationally and internationally and I welcome in advance those that's going to be watching this discourse when it is posted on YouTube, TikTok and the various groups from around the world subsequently. <coughs> Excuse me. I have stated on numerous occasions that our topic on oneness and social cohesion is not something that is found in all the ashrams around the world. Most of the ashrams practice and preach sectarian aspects of the Vedas and by me embarking on my mission on oneness and social cohesion will not be palatable to those who call themselves <coughs> Hindus or Sanatan Dharmis. They would not feel comfortable <coughs> that the Guru is bringing people of all races, all cultures, all traditions together. I think a week ago, last week Sunday, if I'm not too sure, I had a call to attend a march on the beachfront. I think it was a previous Sunday, a march on the beachfront in, and I also gave a small talk to the Muslim community in showing my disgust when people were yanked out of a mosque during prayer in Palestine. So where there is Hindu, Muslim, animosity, it is natural those Hindus will see the Guru as a traitor. Yes or no? You understand? So, this is not Sanatan Dharma. This is not Sanatan Dharma. Sanatan Dharma is not a sectarian religion. Sanatan Dharma is not a sectarian religion. The very first scripture of Sanatan Dharma is the Rig Veda. First and foremost scripture of Sanatan Dharma is the Rig Veda and it is quite distinct in the Rig Veda when it is stated that the world is one diverse family. It is a Vedic injunction. It is a law cast in stone that the world is one diverse family. What is the comprehension of this injunction? What does it tell you? Why would this injunction be in the very first an older scripture known to mankind. Why would it tell you at the outset that this is, the world is one diverse family? Why? Because God is entrenching unity in diversity. Is he not? Right at the outset, 
scripture number one in Sanatana Dharma and the very first scripture ever known to mankind since creation, the Rig Veda. The Supreme Lord is instructing those who are going to be versed in the Vedas to unify the diversity, is it not? At that time there was no Islam. At that time there was no Christianity. At that time there was no Judaism. At that time there were no religious systems on earth. During the Vedic period, the practice was Sanatan Dharma. There was no religion. There was no such thing called Hinduism. There was no such thing called Hinduism. There was only Sanatan Dharma. All of you understand. But the upcoming religions from the point of view of the Rig Veda had to be embraced through the Vedic system. Yes or no? And this is why the Supreme Lord millions and billions and even trillions of years before any religion came on this planet, he already said that the world is one diverse family. What, what else is sectarian in humanity? What else is sectarian in humanity? Race. Is race not sectarian in humanity? Does this verse embrace the different races? Does this verse instruct you, whoever is a follower of the Rig Veda, that you must embrace all races as one? Does it instruct you? At that point in time, at creation, all races appeared simultaneously. All races appeared simultaneously around the world, around the globe. Blacks, Asians, there's no Indian race. There's no such thing as Indian race. Indian is a name given very recently by the colonizers. Those who lived in the continent of Asia are Asians. Those that lived in the continent of Asia are Asiatic Asians. And those that lived in Africa are Africans, black Africans. And those that lived, lived in Europe are Europeans. In South Africa today, in South Africa today, we always start with our own country. How is the race divided? No more, they say, Africans. Now they say, Blacks. No more, they say, Europeans. Now they say, Whites. But they still say Indians. They still say Indians. What generation Indians are we in South Africa? Third, fourth, fifth, sixth generation Indians, all our babies. But why are they calling us Indians? You think we should be called Indians? What link you have, Sita, with India? <laughs> You're living in South Africa, but you are branded an Indian. 
You think that is right? You think somebody should inform the government that we do not want to be identified as Indians? You think we should be identified as Indians? We shouldn't. We have nothing to do with India. That is our ancestral land and that was the land of our ancestors. Every action of ours, whatever action we perform in this country is South African and African because South Africa belongs to Africa as a whole. Yes or no? Now if Hemita cuts this aspect of this discourse and post it on TikTok. Then our very same Indians who don't know whether they are here nor there will comment what is this guru talking about. He should be teaching spiritual science. Why is he talking about politics? Why is he talking about politics. So who is a guru? And what is the bona fide duty of a guru? What must the guru bring you from? Aren't you in darkness if you're calling yourself Indians? Aren't you in darkness if you are falsely being identified and categorized by the government. Aren't you in darkness? So must not the Guru bring you out of darkness into light? What is light? That we should be either referred as light brown or dark brown. Yes, because they identify the Africans as blacks, they gave them a color. <coughs> They identify the Europeans as white. They gave them a color. So why can't they give us a color brown? And then colored. That's a mixture of brown, black and white. <laughs> All colors. I'm serious. It may seem like a joke, but I'm serious. And we should be discussing this. We should be making attempts to fix this false identification. And this is why people say, go back with your ship to India. Because we have an artificial branding, an artificial branding of our race. It shows no permanency. If we are Indians, it means we have no permanent status in South Africa. Yes or no? But what will our... I stated some months ago that in Hinduism, so-called Hinduism, all the gurus are followers and all the followers are gurus. All the gurus are followers and all the followers are gurus. Because if you go, I told Emita to switch off the comments. Because it is really frightening that those that have Hindu surnames and if you look at the profiles, you can see they are Hindus, but they are not Hindus. They know absolutely nothing. Then Hemita also posted a snippet of the Arthi. And they went on to the Arthi and they said, hmm, Me? Never worship a man. You understand? Did the Supreme Lord, Lord Ram, and the Supreme Lord, Lord Krishna, did they worship a man? Yes. 
did lord ram worship a man did lord krishna worship a man who did lord ram worship who was his guru vasista muni lord ram's guru was vasista muni he was a human being he was a saint did the supreme lord the creator of the saint bow down to the saint's feet and take blessings in every action of his life did lord ram do that then these commenters on tiktok these so called hindus who never worship a human being it means they are superior than lord ram and they are superior than lord krishna did lord krishna wash his guru's feet did he also wash the feet of 2000 brahmins did he wash the feet of 2000 brahmin did he bow down and worship his guru sandipan muni yes so whoever do not want to worship a guru or whoever find worshiping a guru is improper then they do not belong in this on this planet earth they do not belong in this universe because the creator of this universe the creator of this universe by instruction and example by instruction and example have shown that bona fide gurus must be worshiped and must be surrendered to must be surrendered to they led by example they led by example sanatan dharma is not a religion it is a science it is a science and in science you have to have examples you have to have experiments you have to have test and you have to have proof so who is the greatest and the absolute scientist from whom does physical science emanate from whom does mathematics emanate from whom does biology emanate from whom does all aspects of this universe emanate it has to be the greatest scientist because everything in this universe is science there is nothing in this universe that is not science everything is in the periodic table is it there or not and when you mix everything that's in the periodic table you get whatever you get today in this universe you yourself you yourself what is the difference between your body the body of an airplane and the body of a truck what is the difference between all these bodies what is the difference any difference if you break down all the elements it's the same break down all the elements is the same it's just a proportion of the elements together with the inhabitation of the soul This is a dead body that you are wearing. The body that all of you are wearing is dead. 
it is only animated by the presence of the soul. It is only animated by the presence of the soul. The minute you remove the soul, the body starts decomposing. Yes or no? The minute you remove the soul, the body starts decomposing. What does decomposing meet, mean? What is decomposition? What it means? Yes, Premila, rotten. All of y'all can hear? Rotten, because always associated with something else that you do which is rotten. You eat rotten meat. Like your body that decomposes the minute the soul leaves, chicken, fish, sheephead, trotters, all these bodies start getting rotten. All these bodies start getting rotten. So what do you do to, pre to stop the rot? What you do to stop the rot? You put it in your mochri. <laughs> your fridge is a mochri for chicken. If you ask the chicken and the sheep and the fish, where was your body frozen, they'll say, in a human mochri. You'll meet them one day. Guaranteed every chicken you at every fish you at every crab you at Nilendri prawns crayfish at Yamraj you're going to meet you're going to meet and they have a duty at Yamraj there's a huge frying pan full of oil as you brace them, they will brace you. <laughs> Boiling hot oil. All meat eaters in my ashram and around the world remember what the Guru is telling. So every time you brace your meat, every time you brace your meat, Guru is not saying don't eat meat. Every time, ladies, you braise your meat in your kitchen, remember you, one day you'll be braised in the same way. <coughs> I hope you enjoy your meat dishes going forward. And those of you men that's not braising, the conviction is the same. Every time you bite that meat, Rakesh Bhai, and Rakesh Bhai likes the marrow, every time you pull the marrow, remember one day somebody will be pulling your marrow. <laughs> this is the beauty of Sanatan Dharma. This is absolute science. For every action, there has to be a reaction. Is that a law or not? So if you eat something that is prohibited, then you have to pay the price. If you don't pay it whilst you are alive, you'll pay it when you are. You don't really die. You just change this body. <coughs> In the intervening period of changing your body, in the intervening period of changing your body, we have Mr. Dharam Raj and Mr. Yam Raj. Dharam Raj is the judge. So th there is a perfect spreadsheet. If human beings could create a computer and get such beautiful 
analysis done on a computer. One button. Ask my Vishwadar, my chairperson. He's an analyst. One button and the computer will do everything. Everything for you. So let me see now. Rakesh Bhai, when you go to Yamraj, whenever, one button, how many souls, bodies, did Rakesh Bhai eat? One button, Dharam Raj will get the whole list. Premila is very worried. Because Premila is brazing. And although she's a vegetarian, although she's a vegetarian, she's brazing for her son. Punishment is the same. So every time when she makes chui, mother and son will be chewing on. Yes, that's the intention. That's why you have gurus to bring you from darkness into light. Even the darkness of your stomach. <laughs> from the darkness of your stomach, guru must make your stomach light. Alright? So how are you authorized to eat vegetables? Because the vegetable also has a soul. Why is God so unfair? There's a soul in a plant and a soul in an animal. You can eat the plant, but you can't eat the animal. Don't you think somebody should be answering that question? Hmm? Yes. Why don't you take your cow and your goat and offer it to the Lord? What stops you? It's called the ecosystem. Everything that exists only has a temporary life. Uh, where do you get pain? Understand pain. From which part of your body is pain experienced? Brain. What is connected to the brain? Nervous system. You have a brain, you have a nervous system, you have a lymphatic system. What are the systems you have? Digestive system. Look at how many systems in you. How many systems are prevalent in an animal? Is there a nervous system in a plant? Does a plant have a brain? Does a plant have nerves? Will the plant feel any pain if you take a few leaves? All of you, um, ashram got enough herbs. Before going home, Mataji will make a plan, even bin bags. Because when you braise that herbs, it's legal. No activation on any spreadsheet. No activation on any spreadsheet. You understand why God created fruits and vegetables in such a manner that it can be consumed by human. And why you should not be eating an animal because an animal has a nervous system it has a brain just like you and when you harm it, that essence of the pain is consumed by you. Every cell of the meat you eat, let's break it down simply. One beautiful piece of chops, so big chops, with the fat, strip of fat on the end. How many cells are inside there? Just in one piece of chop, forget the whole sheep or half a sheep. Just Rakesh Bhai, inside Premila, when you braise in the chops, how many cells are getting braised? 
how many thousand cells inside that one piece of chops. All is carrying the transmission of pain at the point of death. It is carrying the transmission of pain at the point of death. And who's eating that pain? Is <laughs> everything that is made in this universe is made of energy. Energy cannot be created, neither can it be destroyed. Yes or no? Again I said, the Supreme Lord is the Absolute, scientist. So the energy of life in an animal that is cut short, where will that energy be transmuted? Where will that energy be transmuted? In the cell, in the form of pain, because that is the point of conversion, it is death. Yes or no? And it died through pain. And pain is an energy. Is it not? Is pain not energy? And that energy, because it was the last point in its life, which was death, where will that pain energy be stored? Where will that pain energy be stored? In the cell of the meat. When you are eating that meat, would Premila's tasty spy, uh, spice, because that meat is in a rotting state. If you take that meat and eat it as is, that is what you are really eating. Rot. What you are eating? Rot. If you take the meat as is and you eat it, you are eating rot. You disguise it with spice. You disguise it with spice. Go home, meat eaters today. Take one meat from your fridge or mochri. Take it out and let it thaw. You will know what's thaw. Don't add anything to it. And keep one piece in your bedroom, one piece in your dining room, one piece in your kitchen, so you don't have to go too far to eat. <laughs> Take a bite wherever you are. Take a bite wherever you are and smell your fingers. Take that meat, rub it over your face as well. Why are you making you? <laughs> because that's what you're eating. You're eating the same rot. How does meat start rotting? Temperature. Through your room temperature, meat will start rotting. What is room temperature? How many degrees? Twenty-five degrees. It will take a few hours to rot. You take the same meat and you put it in your pot, it rots at 100 degrees Celsius, you expedite in the rot. You just speed in up the rot. That same rot, if you put that meat in water, no salt, no spice, just water at 100 degrees, it becomes soft, then let it cool down and have a tasty meal. So eating meat as it is, is a very rotten affair, is it not? I'm serious. Is it not a very rotten affair? Eating meat as it is, is a rotten affair. You are under illusion meat has taste. That rotten meat, does it have taste or is it bland? Meat on its own without any salt. Does it have taste or is it bland? Bland means tasteless. Bland means tasteless. That chicken is tasteless. That sheep 
is tasteless. That prawns is tasteless. You add artificial taste and lie to yourself that the chicken curry was so tasty. <laughs> you are deceiving yourself that the rotten meat that you are eating is so tasty by you artificially making it tasty. Yes or no? But if you boil a potato and once it is boiled, let it cool and take a spoon and mash it up and eat. Is there taste there? Is there salt in there? Yes, there is salt. Potato contains salt. That salt has been sprinkled by the Supreme Lord when he designed the potato. You eat the natural potato and you eat the natural meat and if there is no such thing as spices and salt, will anybody ever eat meat? Any human will eat meat if there's no spice, no salt. Do you understand? So you think the Supreme Lord, Lord Sri Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita, when he says, you can offer me water, you can offer me a leaf, you can offer me fruit, he don't say offer me half a sheep. Because he does not want to eat rot. He does not want to eat rot. He don't say offer me one Cornish chicken in the Bhagavad Gita. You like Cornish chicken? Remember any meat that goes through your hand. Any meat that goes through your hand. If you vegetarian or not vegetarian. Premila, if somebody stole my clock and told you hold it for 10 minutes and I called the police and it was known as evidence you was holding that clock. You know what it's called? Accessory after the fact. So you are as guilty. <laughs> you are as guilty like stealing my clock when you cook in that meat. Rakesh Bhai, I'm just helping to expedite your journey into vegetarianism. All right? And as a son, I don't think you should be making your mother the accomplice. Yeah, I'm it's unfair of you. Yes, yeah, it's unfair of you. <laughs> All right. Uh, your crime in partner, Satish Bhai, is watching this discourse in Joburg. He's watching this discourse in Joburg. And I hope he understands the implications of what the Guru is saying. It won't be righteous of the Guru not to give you information that is in the Vedas. Lord Ram is not going to come here and tell you, Rakesh Bhai, don't eat meat. Lord Krishna is not going to come here and tell you don't eat meat because he has a representative. His representative must tell you don't eat meat. New devotees, please don't run away. <laughs> it is a process. It is a process and the Guru preaches from practice. Guru preaches from practice. Five <coughs> kilometers up the road here is a butchery. Reservoir Hills Butchery. The owner of the butchery, his name is Dennis. And go ask him for the past 20 years since he took over the butchery, how many half a sheep the guru ate? Four half a sheep a month. How many? Four half a sheep a month only for the guru. Dennis is still there. Alright? So don't be upset with what the guru is saying. I still love my meat. 
I still love my chops. Milendri, I wasn't a chicken eater. I loved my meat. But because I follow God's instructions and I follow my Guru's instructions, I as a human being have to leave what I love. I, as a human being, have to leave what I love. So let's put some time frames. I met my guru in 2008. I left meat in 2013. Met my guru in 2008. Left meat in 2013. I tried to leave meat on a number of occasions. Six months, seven months, and we failed. We, it's not an easy thing. It is not easy to live, meet. I tried my best. There was one Friday I remember. At about 8 o'clock I told Mataji I can't manage and I think it was about 8 months we had left, meet. She said me too. I said, what must we do? She said, Nando's is open. <laughs> so we drove down to Nando's because it was after 8 and I said, I'm going back to chicken. I stopped off at Aquarius. Stopped off at Aquarius. You all know what Aquarius is? Restaurant pub. Restaurant so it wasn't an easy journey for the Guru himself. It's not going to be an easy journey for everyone. And the Guru has the love and the compassion <coughs> of understanding how difficult it is because the Guru found it difficult himself. All of you understand? So I can sit here today without any conscience giving this discourse without any conscience giving this discourse because I've been there but I had no knowledge. Nobody told me that the meat I was eating was rotten and I don't think any guru anywhere in the world has described this discourse as I have described it and broken it down in its simplicity as I have described it. This is my own take but it is a scientific take it is a truth and you can go home and experiment it yourself. Alright? Bhaiya, got meat in your mochri or fridge? Yeah. Tell Bhabi, cut the pieces, put it in each room, you and your daughter, put in your daughter's room too. Alright? And then eat the meat, smell the rot, drink that filthy water, and phone the guru and tell the guru what they expect. See my baby, brand new devotee I got. See how she's enjoying it? You also my newest devotee, Yamita? Alright, see how she's enjoying it. When she go home, she'll explain how the rotten meat is. Alright? So this is why you come to satsang. You come to break patterns in your mind. You come to break habits that is in your mind. Remember we grow up and our mind is grooved. Our mind is grooved in addictions, in habits, in mannerisms. All these things are grooved in our mind. You all remember there used to be a game with grooves in it and one bead. The bead can only enter through that one groove until it comes in the center and come out the same way. Now when you come to the Guru, the Guru want to break those groovings. The Guru want to change you. Because if the groovings are there, that groovings has computed your body and your reaction in a particular behavior. You can't behave as you have been behaving after meeting the Guru. 
then you have wasted your time. If your behavior is the same before meeting the Guru, and if your behavior is the same after meeting the Guru, you wasted your time and the Guru's time. When you come to satsang, you must come to change your behavior. You must come to change your behavior. If you have been screaming at your husband for the past 30 years that you are married, when you come to satsang, then when you go back home, you can still scream at your husband, Premila, but lower the volume. <laughs> lower the volume. It mustn't be that on number 10. It must go to nine and a half, nine, eight and a half, eight, until it comes to zero. But you still scream at zero. He won't hear you. He won't hear you. All of you understand? What is the use coming to satsang if you don't change in the direction of divinity? Even if you are used to screaming at your children, hounding your children, even if the children are naughty, start talking to them in a different tone. Make yourself loving. Because when you become loving, everyone around you becomes loving. And this is why there is a saying, if you want to change the world, change your self. So I had a mission to change the world. My mission is to change the world. But before I change the world, what I had to do? I had to stop drinking. I had to stop smoking. I had to stop eating meat. And I had to stop giving kanpatis. <laughs> you all know what are kanpatis? I had to stop booting. I had to stop kicking. I had to stop punching. I had to stop heading. <coughs> all right? I had to do all of these things. And only when I came right at the age of 51, it took me many years to come right. When I came right at the age of 51, my guru handed me the baton. And he said, go my boy, now you are ready to change the world. And from this ashram, yeah, at 28 Dunstable Crescent, Reservoir Hills, in Durban, South Africa, I started changing the world one atom at a time. One atom at a time. I've already achieved changing the political consciousness of South Africa. You will see next week. I already achieved changing the inter-religious consciousness of South Africa. I already achieved changing the intercultural consciousness of South Africa. I've already achieved social cohesion and changing the social cohesion consciousness of South Africa. Africa. I've already achieved all of these things. But before achieving all of these things, I had to be the change. I had to be the change I wanted to see in my society. I had to be the change I wanted to see in my country. And this is what the Guru teaches you on a more compartmentalized dimension that if your house is not right, you must be the change in your house. Who? Oh? You must be the change in your house. You change. And like a magnet, everyone else will change because they will want to follow you. You know, there was a time... I was an atheist for many, many, many years. You all know what an atheist is? Do not believe in God. And I had a reason not to believe in God. Because I didn't have teachers. We didn't have gurus that could have taken me by the scruff of my collar and shook me into God-realization and self-realization. We didn't have. But I'm proud to see that this generation, 
there is a lot of cultural affiliation by the younger generation. When myself, Mataji was growing up, I met Mataji in Standard 9 in school. When we grew up, we grew up with the 80s music. You know the 80s music, the 90s. I hear it now, my sons play it, and I, and I go back into that world. Good music. Good music. There was no culture in our time. And now I see on TikTok, I see Indian girls, I even see Indian aunties, Indian ladies from all ages on TikTok. They are in their culture, singing their chutneys, their bhangras. They're moving with their dots, they're hearing nothing. They're getting their views. But it's a good thing in a way that our culture is continuing. In my time, no culture. Nobody could explain to me. My one mama is Anuman devotee, another mama, mama is a, a Shiva devotee, one is a Vishnu devotee. Same father, three sons, three different dimensions. What happens to you? What happens to you? Then I should notice the same Hindus, when they become Muslim or Christian, they become better than the best Muslim and better than the best Christian. Why? Why? When they go to church, a converted Christian is a more loyal Christian than an original Christian. Yes or no? And a converted Muslim is a more loyal Muslim than a... And these come from our family. Yes or no? Why? Because when you go to church, they tell you, drain your Hindu mind. When you become a Muslim, they tell you, drain your Hindu mind. Because the most amount of corruption is where? It is in the Hindu mind. When you are a Hindu, you know everything. When you are a Hindu, you are the Guru. You know everything. If I say, don't do it like this, do it like that, what will you tell me as a Hindu? My grandfather did it. My father did it. Who the hell is this guru to tell me to change? But when you become a Christian, they tell you, throw your lambs. They tell you, forget all the deities you are worshipping and even forget your family. You can't even go to your mother's funeral or if you go there, you can't perform any rituals. Yes or no? So what happens to the mind when they are told that? It is reprogrammed. It is reprogrammed. So they don't carry any of the Hindu know-it-all into Christianity. Hindu know-it-all into Christianity. There they surrender. There they surrender. Why can't you surrender to your own guru in Hinduism and throw the Hindu know-it-all? Why can't you do that? Then the guru is a fake. That guru knows too much. Uh, we did it all my life like this. What that guru knows? One stupid comedy, Karo Charo, took him on. He can't handle that comedian. Caro Charo, but is coming to teach us how to change our lives. Do you understand? Am I being reasonable and logical? So as a Hindu, as a Sanatan Dharmi, instead of converting to a religion, remove the muck from your mind. Remove the Mark from your mind. In everything else that you do, you follow procedure, yes or no? When you cook in, you follow procedure of your stove? Yeah? When you bath in, you follow procedure of the bathroom? Yeah? 
When you're driving in the road, you follow procedure. When you go in the airport, you follow procedure. When you go to work, you follow procedure. Then why don't you want to follow the procedure in Sanatan Dharma? Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad? There's no grannies and grandfathers in the Bhagavad Gita. No nani, nana, aja, aji, tati, tata in the Bhagavad Gita. If they are not here, there is a verse for nani, nana, aji, aja, tati, tata, and all the devis and devtas. There is a verse in the Bhagavad Gita that Lord Krishna says. Lord Krishna says, if you worship your ancestors, after death, you will go to your ancestors. If you worship devis and devtas, after death, you will go to your devis and devtas. And if you worship me, after death, you will come to me. Where are your ancestors? Where are they now? In which dimension are they now? In Pitralok. So if you worship them, when you die, you'll go to them. Have they got food? Have they got water? Where they come for food and water? During Pitral Park, they come down for food and water, yes or no? So if you want to follow your nannies and nanas and tatis and tatas after death, no? Food and water. You'll go to Pitra Lok. You understand? Pitra Lok is temporary. Yes? Temporary. Devi Lok. This is Devi Lok. And where the devis and devtas live is called heaven. Is it not called heaven? Heaven is also temporary. Heaven is temporary. You worship them. You go to heaven. After your merits are finished, you come back down here as a human being. You come back down here as a human being and start again. How many of you like temporary things? Which human likes temporary things? You want a husband, you want him permanently. You have a second wife, you'll dig his eyes out. <laughs> you want your husband permanently? Yes? You want your wife permanently? <coughs> you want money permanently? You want good food permanently? Is there anything you want temporary? then why would you want to go to Pitralok, which is temporary? Why would you want to go to heaven, which is temporary, when God is saying, if you worship your ancestors, you'll go to your ancestors, which is temporary. If you want to worship the cosmic administrators, all these 330 million devis and devtas are cosmic administrators. If you want to worship them, they have a temporary abode. When your merits get finished, you'll fall down. But if you worship me, then you will be with me permanently. Tell me how many of you have been happy permanently here? How many of you have been happy permanently here? But what are you always striving for? Happiness? You're looking for happiness in your husband. You're looking for happiness in your wife. You're look, looking for happiness in your job. You're looking for happiness in your children. You're looking for happiness in everything you do. Has anyone able to hold on to that happiness? Anyone? I was a businessman before I became a guru. I was happy eating my meat. I was happy drinking, 
I was happy smoking. I was happy in all those things in the material life. But I will never go back to it. Why? Because that was artificial happiness. After I realized my source of happiness, my reservoir of happiness, I won't go anywhere else. You can take me to court, you can call me a fake guru, you can do what you want, my ashram will carry on because my happiness is in serving my guru and serving the Lord. Ultimate happiness. You can't get more happier than serving your guru and serving the Lord. Why? Because that is the constitutional position of the soul. The duty of the soul is to serve the Lord and nothing else. We forgot that duty. That's what Sanatan Dharma means. Sanatan Dharma means the soul's eternal duty with the Lord. That is what Sanatan Dharma means. And that is what the Guru does. The Guru's job is to bring you to ashram and teach you how to get connected to the Supreme Lord. So just before I round up, I was a policeman for nine full years. Throughout my law, throughout my life, I have been involved in law. I was a director in a law firm with advocates and lawyers and my job was investigating investigations. I was head of investigations. If an advocate wanted one bullet to win the case, I will provide the advocate with a whole magazine full of bullets to win the case. That was my job. That is how meticulous I am in evidence gathering. If a crime happens in my presence. If a crime happens in my presence, because I am a guru now, must I turn my head away from that crime? Okay, let's understand it this way. If I cross the red robo, when I get a ticket and I'm a guru, am I compelled to pay the fine? If I have an X amount of money in the bank, am I compelled to pay tax? Yes? If I fraud you, am I compelled to appear in court, go through the process and get locked up? upon conviction? Does my guruness change my citizenship in this country? Does it change my citizenship in the country? So, I am a guru in a context, but whilst being a guru in a spiritual context, I am a human being and a citizen of this country pay my taxes, obey the law, do everything that an ordinary citizen does in the country. Yes or no? So if you commit a crime against me, if you commit a crime against me or if I witness you committing a crime, am I not duty bound as a citizen with all my experiences, I was a policeman for nine years. If I see a murder taking place in my presence, must I act on that murder with my military training and try and thwart that crime? Or must I say, no man, I'm a guru now. Look this way and let the murder occur. I'm asking you, let's be logical. 
I have experience as a military man. I'm not. I must use my military expertise, even though I'm a guru. Yes or no? It's only logical and common sensical. If I was a politician for 20 years, actively involved in politics in this country, and if I see my country breaking down, must I go to Lord Narayan and ask him to come and fix my country, or must I use my experience and get actively involved in fixing my country? What should I do? Or must I turn my head and say, I'm a guru now, let this country fail? Are you understanding me? And if I see law being transgressed, and would my background knowledge in law, should I turn my head because I'm a guru now, or should I actively participate in the transgressions of what is happening? Do you understand? Because many people in the comments, when uh, Hemita is, is posting snippets, you can't post a whole discourse on uh, TikTok, people are not going on YouTube and reading uh, and understanding the entire discourse in the context. They want to know why is this guru involved in politics? Why is this guru involved in crime? Why is this guru involved in law? I have, I have spent... 30 years in all these dimensions. I'm a guru now. I can't throw it away. I can't throw it away. It is not the qualification of every guru to know law. It is not the qualification of every guru to be involved in the military. It is not the qualification of every, every guru to be involved in societal dynamics. It is where God pushed me in my 51 years before I became a guru. So I must exploit my own experiences going forward as a guru. Yes or no? All of you understand? So lastly, I don't think it will be right, but lastly I want to say that in December 23rd, I was... I received an interim protection order from Karo Charo Tanasegren Mudli. This was a false order, it was a vexatious order, it had no merits. The Chatsworth Court, Chatsworth Court blundered because they keep changing magistrates. They do not have a structure, a permanent structure in place. And Karo Charo for the past couple of years he saw this gap that there's new magistrates and he kept on he took out 18 orders would my orders he took out 18 orders against six other people and in the past two years he has not won any of the orders but the dilemma is that the Chatsworth justice system the administrative system has no power to stop this delinquent, this vexatious person, to stop him from continuously taking orders, taking out interim protection orders. Sometimes you need to use common sense together with the law. Using the law technically at all times will make narcissists like this man find a gap. And he found a gap and he's exploiting that gap. Whoever opposes him anywhere, he goes and takes out a protection order against that person, then that person can't open their mouth. Then he goes on his vile platform. There is no other more vile platform on, the, on earth than Karo Charo's platform. No person has spoken such vulgarity with such vile descriptions than himself. And I want to say it. 
And I want to say it. I have females here. And I want you to understand why I got involved in this case. He asked a particular female to open her legs so that he can pass a horse and trailer through. Have you, has any human on this earth? I'm coming from the military. I'm coming from the Dashins, Warwick Avenue in Durban. I'm coming from places where we men talk and describe. But no such description has ever entered me. I'm 61 years old today. Then he has also stated to another female that she must open her legs so he can pour concrete into that cavity. Have, can a human being ever say a thing like this? There are two ladies who's receiving psychiatric treatment that have come forward to me and asked my assistance. You think as a guru, I was supposed to tell these people, no, I'm a guru, I can't help you. So I went after him. I, I went after him meticulously. I prodded him because I wanted him to open a false case against me as he has opened false cases against these two ladies and other people, 18 false cases. But my planning was to prod him to such an extent that he goes and he opens a vexatious case against me. When he opened that case against me, then he, a narcissist is a person who is the aggressor. A narcissist, by definition, is a person who is the aggressor and he has such finesse he or she that they can change the aggression and upload it upon the victim and they become the victim this is this is the sum and substance of the cases that he has opened so he goes he's a man behind his platform there is no greater man, not Superman, not Spider-Man, none of these great personalities greater than him. But in court, he's a sissy. <laughs> in court, he's a sissy. I don't want to use the M word with a double F. It's not guru-like. <laughs> right? So I'll use the S word. Sissy sounds, I can't say sissy in, in the ashram. Sissy means? A man who acts like a woman in front of men when he can't confront them. That's a sissy. Imagine he has taken, he has opened three harassment orders against females. But he calls himself M-A-D-H-I-R. But he takes out harassment orders against females you understand so he kept on playing the victim and every time the evidence was pointing against him he manipulated the judicial system he manipulated so he had a lawyer then he realized what his lawyer is going to fail then he fired his lawyer. This is not the first lawyer he fired. But I wanted this case to be with me and him because I can stand not to toe to toe with him. He's a demon. I can't stand toe to toe with a demon. I wanted to stand on his head. So from day one that he opened the case I was standing on his head but I didn't want to crush him. I'm just standing on his head. Then he asked his lawyer to make a deal with me and withdraw the case. I said, there's only one deal. You go on your social media platform and how you accused me to be a fraud and a fake, go and invite, what you call them, netizens. Go and invite your netizens 
then call them onto your show and tell them that I have now realized this guru is not a fraud and a fake. I am a fraud and a fake because nobody has seen my real face. I am a fraud and a fake because nobody has seen my real face. Nobody has seen Karo Charo's real face. How can a fraud call a person that can be seen in his reality a fraud? Do you understand? So he refused and I refused him withdrawing the case. Remember, I'm the respondent. How happy a respondent will be for the withdrawal of a case? You understand? I did not. I said I'll go to court and even if the court technically finds me guilty, I rather accept that from the court than do a deal with the devil. You understand? Then he tried to withdraw it with the magistrate and I, the same thing, go on all platforms, apologize and then I will consider a withdrawal. But in court there is such, there is an injunction as a complainant where you can go and set aside your case. So he went on Friday, he went and set aside the case against me. You understand? So we knew what he was doing. So I gave him a present. Guru's always grace. Guru's always grace. I gave him a present of a summons for one million rand for defaming the Guru and the Ashram. Then I've advised two other parties to also give him summons for defamation which he will get in this coming week. Alright. So I'm a very small guru. Fraud guru, fake guru. I, did, I couldn't go to 10 million, 20 million. I went for the lowest amount. Small guru, 1 million. I don't know how much his defamation will be from this other entities and then he's also going to get a court interdict high court interdict so I did not go after this man for six months waiting as any guru would if a person transgresses and he shows remorse if he transgresses and he shows remorse and if a guru does not accept his remorse then you can start looking at the quality and caliber of a guru this man has not stopped he's escalated himself to such a state that now he is selling tickets to do a show on the Guru. So I decided with my attorney that we also need to make some money and because he's not one of the hottest comedians because I saw a lot of comedians line up. Go see in the paper 10 comedians are banding up, 15 comedians are banding up. Nobody is take, touching him. So I said maybe in his shows he'll be able to make a million rand because he got four shows. After his cost, he'll be working for the guru. Maybe indirectly he'll be my disciple in his shows because all the proceeds will have to come to the guru because you, you have to have a record. He has to have a record of his income and expenses. Otherwise, we'll put SARS onto him. We'll put SARS onto him. All right. So he got two more summons coming. He got a high court interdict, and the hawks have landed. And the hawks have landed. Whilst he was in court with me on Friday, the hawks were in the admin department. He got some spies in the admin department. 
you can go to the admin department and find out that the hawks have landed they are in Durban so to tackle a guru publicly might not be a very wise thing not this guru because this guru has been through life i've been a policeman i've been in law i've been in warwick avenue i moved to the biggest of the biggest of gangsters as i said my son seated in a the back there the dashins used to change his napkins when he was 2 years old and the dashins were the biggest gangsters they didn't know which day i'll arrest them one of them came and gave a testimony here about 2 months ago that when i walked down warwick avenue there was silence then you get this man i don't know if he's a man or a woman because the dressing you can't make out dark glasses duk you know he's taking this guru on how you think he's ever going to make it all of you understand so i have to report this is a real life uh, new devotees this is a real life ramayan and mahabharat taking place all right and and he is part of the villain he is part of the villain so according to him i'm a fake guru because i did not accept his apology he said he became a disciple and instead after he called me fraud and fake according to him i supposed to place him on my lap take out his dark glasses take out his duk take some oil rub it on his psoriasis head and say my boy please do not call the guru fraud and fake according to him that's a bona fide guru he calls a guru fraud and fake he sends these posters around the world and then he expects that to test a guru whether he is fraud the guru must sit him on his lap and pacify him well other gurus may if i get him on my lap what do you think will happen jay shri manarayan <laughs>